Okay. Okay. It's chapter, it's chapter one. Yes, chapter one. Okay. Yes. Oh, at first we have, can you see my notes? Yes. You can see what I'm writing, eh? Yeah. Yes. Okay, it's fine. So we are going to start with at first, what is economics? What is economics? So basically, economics is defined as a social science. It is defined as a social science whereby we try to study how different economic agents, how different economic agents deals with the problem of scarcity. We are trying to study how different economic agents deals with the basic economic problem, okay? Basically, we try to discover, we try to discover the behavior of these economic agents when they are faced with the basic economic problem, okay? So what are these economic agents that we are referring to? What are these economic agents? These economic agents include households. They include firms as well as any government unit. Okay, any government unit. These are the economic agents we are referring to. Okay. And we are saying that the economic, since it is a social science, we are trying to study how does households, how does uh, firms, how does government units deal with the basic economic problem? And the basic economic problem is known as scarcity. Okay. Scarcity is the basic problem. Okay. And what does scarcity mean? What do scarcity mean? Scarcity simply means it is a situation whereby there are unlimited, whereby there are unlimited ones, methods, limited scarcity fields, whereby we have unlimited ones versus limited resources. So we are saying that within an economy, either it's on the household perspective, either on the firm's perspective, or on government units perspective, they prevail what is known as the basic economic problem. And that basic economic problem is known as scarcity. And what is scarcity? It is simply a situation where there is unlimited ones versus limited resources. What we want outweighs the resources that achieves those ones, okay? So let's say scarcity that is prevailing on a household level, on household level, let's take for example, let's say we have a household, so a household are also individuals, okay? So we might take an example of one individual whereby this individual we have limited resources against unlimited ones, okay? This individual, for example, might want to buy an iPhone and a laptop at the same time, but does his resources permit him to do so? His resource, this individual, maybe an iPhone is costing 5,000, a laptop is also costing 5,000, but his income is only 5,000 rent, which is not enough for this individual to buy both the iPhone and the laptop at the same time. And that is what we are referring to as scarcity. 
Okay. The individual wants outweighs the resource. So the individual resource here is in form of income. So it means at the end of the day, this individual must make a choice. Should I buy an iPhone or should I buy a laptop? Okay, because his resources are not enough to buy both products at the same time. So he needs to make a choice. And when the individual makes a choice, let's say to buy an iPhone, he incurs what is known as opportunity cost. Opportunity cost is the next best alternative for gone. It is the next best alternative for gone. We simply mean that after the individual have decided to purchase an iPhone, what the individual have left behind is the laptop. Okay. So the laptop is the next best alternative for gone. It is the opportunity cost because his resources are not enough to purchase both. So he has sacrificed the laptop and bought an iPhone, okay? And that is what we are referring to as opportunity cost, okay? Is it making sense, get you? Yes. Merci. Okay. So, uh, this is with regard to uh, the basic economic problem. This is regard to uh, the introduction, okay? So, we have defined what economics is. We have taken a look on the economic problem. And we said the economic problem is scarcity, which prevails on individual level, firms level, as well as on household level. Okay. Hello? Can you, can you hear me? Hello? Hello? Okay, can you hear me? Hello? Hello? No, it seems like uh, you, uh, we have a network problem. I can't hear you now. You cannot hear me. Hello? Hello? Okay, I think you had lost me because of network, no? Yes. Okay, okay, my network is quite unstable, but I hope now it seems better. Okay, so we want to take a look as well. So we have taken into account what is economics, the basic economic problem. We now need, okay, let's take a look on the production possibility curve. So with regard to scarcity, we can also show scarcity on a production possibility curve, okay? This is what we are referring to as the production possibility curve. Production possibility curve shows two goods that a country can produce. Shows two goods that a country can produce. So here we have a country which is producing books as well as pencils, okay? And we are saying that if this country uses all resources, if it makes use of all resources, then it is able to produce at point A, point B, point C, point D, point E, point F. So on the production possibility curve, 
is whereby it makes use of all available resources. Okay. It makes use of all available. So when it decides to move from point A to point B, it means it has to sacrifice some amount of books so as to produce an additional unit of pencils. It needs to sacrifice five books so as to produce an amount of pencils. The reason is for the fact that the resources does not permit for this country to produce more of both goods at the same time, and that is scarcity. So point A, B, C, D on the production possibility curve shows the full utilization of the available resources. Point G is an unattainable point. It is not able to produce at point G. Why? Because the resources that are available does not permit it to produce at that point. And it is a point that shows scarcity, okay? Okay. So, so we have shown that point E is a point that shows a, a scarcity. Point B, it shows the full utilization of resources. And point D, it shows the underutilization of resources. A nation that is producing at point D, it has more resources but it is only making use of just a few of the resources that it has. Okay. And point D shows it is a, whereby there is unemployment of resources. Okay. It is whereby there are resources that are lying idle. But when it starts to produce at point B, it is now making use of all available resources. Point E, it is an unattainable point, okay? So we have, uh, within the branch of economics, we have, uh, we can subdivide economics into micro and macroeconomics, okay? Microeconomics, it is the study of economics at an individual part. We are only studying the economy on a basis of only individuals, only households, or only firms. But if we go a step further to study macroeconomics is whereby we are studying the economy as a whole. We are studying all individuals plus all households or all firms at the same time. So when we are studying macroeconomics, we are now studying economics on a broader perspective than when we are studying microeconomics, okay? So that is the difference between microeconomics, like from the word itself, micro means something which is small, macro means something which is large, okay? Macro means something which is large, we have what are known as positive and normative statements. Positive statements are fact-based. They cannot be disagreed upon. Just like if we say the unemployment rate in South Africa is this percentage, that cannot be argued against because the statistics they are there that can prove that yes, this is the rate of unemployment, okay? Normative statements, these are statements that can be argued against. Why? Because they are subjective, they are not fact-based, and they cannot be tested. Just like to say, what do you prefer? Do you prefer law? unemployment or do you prefer high inflation? Some may say no. Let's reduce the levels of unemployment. 
and ignore inflation rates. Some may say, no, we cannot play around with inflation. And those are known as normative statements. So they are based on judgment, okay? Your judgment might be different from the other person judgment, okay? So we have taken into account the economic problem. We have taken into account the economic problem and we have defined it. With regard to economic problem, we also consider what are known as three fundamental economic questions. These three fundamental economic questions, they include what to produce, how should it be produced, and for whom should it be produced for. So we have what are known as economic systems. Economic systems answer these questions differently. What should be produced? How should it be produced? And for whom should it be produced for? They answer these basic uh, the fundamental economic questions differently. What should be produced in terms of a free market economy? They simply produced what, what is profitable, okay? But with regard to the command economy, they simply produced for, they simply produced for everyone. How should it be produced? Basically, the private sector answers this question by the fact that they want to produce in a manner that is very cost effective. But in a command economy, the government does. It does not matter. It simply wants the product to be available. So that's why at times you can see that the government can continue to run projects, can continue to do its business even on a loss. For whom should it be produced for with regard to the free market economy, they only produce for those who can afford. But with regard to the command economy, they produce for everyone, okay? So if you go to a public hospital, everyone can be assisted. But if you go to a private health facility, you can see that they only produce for those who can afford, okay? So we have different kinds of goods. We have consumer goods, uh, consumer goods. Uh, these are goods that are produced for the final consumer, okay? We have capital goods. These are used to produce other goods. And final goods are also are almost the same as consumer goods they are produced for the final consumer. Intermediate goods are like inputs. Private goods, they are produced in the private sector. Public goods, they are produced for everyone. Just like street lights, they are produced for everyone. We have free goods in which you do not pay, just like air, just like sunshine. Economic goods, uh, these are produced with scarce resources. They are produced in the private sector. Homogeneous goods, they are uniform. They are identical, just like water. Heterogeneous goods, they are different in every manner. They are known as heterogeneous goods. Okay, so we have already taken into account the production possibility curve, whereby we said that within the production possibility curve, it shows two goods that a nation can produce. Point F is the underutilization of resources. Point A, B, C, and D, and E is full utilization of resources. Point G is an unattainable point. It is an unattainable point, okay. So the PPC is also subject to shift. It can shift outwards, it can shift inwards. When it shifts outwards from AE to HI, this is known as economic growth. When the PPC 
shift outwards, it is known as economic growth. It can also shift from here and shift inwards, okay? That would be a negative growth, okay? What sectors do we have in an economy? We have the primary, we have the secondary sector, we have the tertiary sector, we also have the quaternary sector. So the primary sector, it is the, the, the activities like mining, forestry, fishing takes place. Many of the inputs, they come from the primary sector. The secondary sector, they make use of these primary inputs that comes uh, from the primary sector and they convert these primary inputs into an output. And then the tertiary sector is a service sector. We have the quaternary sector where research and development uh, mostly take place, okay? So we have a uh, different types of economic systems. We have the traditional economy, which is mostly characterized by butter trade. We have the command economy, which is mainly comprised of the government. We have the free market economy. We have the market economy, which is not a uh, listed here, it is known as the free market economy, which is mostly characterized by the private uh, sector. We also have what is known as the mixed economy, which is a mixture of the central uh, planned economy or the command economy, as well as the free market economy. It is a mixture of the two and it is known as a mixed economy, okay? So, uh, the three major flaws within the economy, mainly these are also known as the methods of calculating national income. What do they include? How do we calculate national income? We can calculate national income using the production approach the income approach, as well as the spending approach. It is also known as the expenditure approach. So the production is also known as the output approach. The income is whereby we make use, we sum up all income earned by factors of production. That is interest, uh, that is uh, include profits, uh, that include uh, dividends, all the income earned by factors of production is whereby we make use of the income approach. And the spending approach is whereby we take into account consumption expenditure, investment expenditure, government expenditure, as well as net exports. If we take them all into account, they become what is known as the spending approach, okay? So we have stock and flow variables. Flow variables is measured over a specific period of time. If we measure a variables over a specific period of time, let's say over three months time, it would be known as a flow variable. If we measure a variable on a particular period of time, it is known as a stock variable. So flow variables include income, which is measured over a period of time, profit over a period of time, loss investments, number of birth and deaths over a period of time. But if we take into account wealth, assets, liabilities, Population. Hello? Hello? I'm 
Ano? Ano? Hello? Hello? Get you, hi. Hello? Hello? Hello, can you hear me, Get you? Hi. Okay, can Hello, you? can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, I, I, yes, I can hear you. Okay. okay. So we have uh, we have taken a, a look on what are known as stock variables and what are known as flow variables. You can hear me, right? Hello? 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 Hello, hi. Hi. Uh, I think it's a network. Yeah, it now starts to... Uh, Miss, can you unmute yourself? Okay, can you hear me, Miss? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, okay, it's fine. Okay, hope... Uh, Network won't. Okay, so we have what is known as the circular flow mode of income. We have what is known as the circular flow mode of income. This circular flow mode of income, we are trying to establish the relationship between firms and households. Okay, households are the owners of factors of production. They are the owners of factors of production. So they offer factors of production to the factor markets in which the firms make use of these factors of production to produce goods and services. These goods and services are also sold to the households, okay? Are also sold to the households. The other way around is where we are saying that Households, which are the ones that have offered these factors of production, in return, they get an income. And the firms that makes use of these uh, factors of production, they spend with the, the factor markets, okay? And households that we have said that are the ones that purchase these goods and services, spend within the goods market and then when they spend within the goods market the firms they receive income after you spend the firms they then receive income at the end of the day so to them it's profit to them it is income okay so that is known as the circular flow mode of income it's similar to this one it is known as the circular flow mode of income okay now let's take into account uh, the concept of demand the concept of supply and then how is the price determined so basically the price is determined when the demand and supply curves meet so the demand curve is downward sloping it is downward sloping the reason is when the price of a good increase let's say from 20 to 40 then it becomes very expensive we now tend to buy less okay so let's say at 20 the quantity demand of 
of bread, let's say the good is bread, at 20, the quantity demand is 160. When the price increases to 40, then we now tend to buy less. If the price continues to increase to 75, we also tend to buy less because the good is now very expensive, okay? And then if we join all those points, they give rise to what is known as the demand curve. So the demand curve is downward sloping, whereby it is showing that when the price of a product increases, then the demand for that product will decrease. It will act in an opposite way, okay? But a supply curve, it does not act like that. So within the context of a demand curve, we are giving reference to a buyer. So because the buyer is the one whom purchases a product, okay? When we are giving reference to supply, we are saying that the supplier is the firm itself. To the supplier, if the price is five rand, the supplier is only supplying 200 units of bread. If it increases to 10 rand, it is now a bit attractive to produce more. If it continues to increase, the supplier will also continuously increase its product. So you can see that when the price is increasing, quantity supplied is also increasing by that same manner, okay? okay. By that same manner. So if we add the individual demand curves, if we add them all, they give us what is known as the market demand curve. So a market demand curve is simply the when we sum up all individual demand curves. If we sum up all individual demand curves, they give us rise to what is known as a market demand curve. So a market demand curve is also downward sloping, okay? It is also downward sloping. So if we add uh, the demand curve for individual A, individual B, we come up with a market demand curve for C. So it is also downward sloping, okay? So, Ceteris Paribas, what does it mean? Ceteris Paribas is whereby it is simply an assumption of holding everything constant. We are saying that, let's say we are only trying to discover a relationship between the price of a good and its demand. We assume, a, we assume what is known as Ceteris Paribas, which is simply an assumption whereby we are saying that all things are equal. We are only trying to consider the relationship between these two variables, okay? We are not considering anything else. We are only considering that uh, relationship between the two, okay? So we have taken into account before the household firms interaction. We have end these, we are, referring to here, we are saying that we have resources. These resources could be in form of land, in form of labor. We have four resources. We have land, labor, capital, entrepreneurship. What is the return to land, which is also natural resources? The return to land is rent. The return to labor are uh, wages and salaries. The return to capital is interest. The return to entrepreneurship is profit, okay? So this is the demand curve that we have taken into account. So the law of demand simply specifies that there is an inverse relationship between price and quantity demand. There is a negative relationship between price and quantity demand. If the price of a good is increasing, the quantity demand will be decreasing. It acts in an opposite way. And that is known as the law of demand, okay? So the demand curve is also subject to shift. There is also what is known as a movement along the demand curve and a shift of the demand. Curve. So a movement along the demand curve is whereby we are saying that it is only a movement on a single demand curve. It is only a movement on a single demand curve, but whenever 
there is now a shift of the demand curve 